Um, so almost 75 years ago, a young enlisted Coast Guardsman named Douglas Monroe was killed in action near Point Cruz, Guadalcanal. And here, almost 75 years after his death, we've gathered to honor Douglas Monroe, to commemorate this young man. Why? More than 16 million Americans served during World War II. So why do we recognize this one act of bravery after all these years? Why do we look to this young man as a symbol of leadership and of inspiration? A symbol of what the Coast Guard is and what it does, and a symbol of the very best a Coast Guardsman can be. Now, when I moved to my position, uh, from my position at Marine Corps History to the Coast Guard's historian's office, I was familiar with the story of Douglas Monroe, but, but I thought I had something of a unique opportunity here. Um, I wanted to understand who this young man was, and I wanted to understand what the Coast Guard's mission in World War II was. But what really intrigued me was the whole story from a Marine Corps perspective. I wanted to know what happened in late September 1942 that led to his participation in the Second Battle of the Matanacau and his untimely death. Now, I can tell you that the Marines certainly know Doug Monroe. Um, they hold him in great respect. If you go look at the Medal of Honor exhibit here in the museum, there's a picture of Doug Monroe. Um, we all know the elements of the story, Marines and Coast Guardsmen, uh, that he died while supporting U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal. Most people don't know the details of that action. Um, I was interested and I started looking at the definitive histories of Guadalcanal. And, and those days between 24 and 27 September are given fairly scant mention. It's not widely discussed. This is not the battle for Henderson's Field or Edson's Ridge where Marines beat back a determined enemy and prevailed. Simply put, this is not a high point in Marine Corps history in World War II. So my question was, what happened? How did Douglas Monroe find himself off Point Cruz on that fateful day in September? What occurred during that expansion of Marine lines along the Matanacau that necessitated an evacuation of almost 500 Marines? I mean, being a former Marine Corps historian, and we like to think Marines always do things right. So, so what went so wrong that that had to happen? Well, before we start talking about that, let's go back to the beginning and take a look at this young man who would become the only Coast Guardsman to be awarded a Medal of Honor. He was born 11 October 1919. His mother, Edith, had been born in Lancashire, United Kingdom. She was the eighth of 12 children. Uh, her father was killed in an industrial accident when she was only six. So in 1910, her mother makes the decision she's going to pick up the whole family and move them to British Columbia. Um, two of her elder brothers made the trip first. Uh, they settled into a large home in Vancouver. And Edith, along with her mother and the rest of her siblings, made the crossing on the USS Tunisia. Now, following her graduation from high school, she attended business school. And while employed in Vancouver, she met James Monroe. Now, James Monroe was actually born James Wilkins in Sacramento, California. His parents divorced when he was a child. Uh, his mother emigrated to Canada and there met and married Daniel Albert Monroe, who adopted James. Now, he was an electrician by trade. He was employed by the Bunsen Lake Power Station when he met Edith. They were married in what is now Christ Church Anglican Cathedral on 20 September 1914. And on the event of her hair, uh, marriage, Edith became a naturalized citizen. Uh, the Monroes had a daughter, Patricia, and a son, Douglas Albert. Now, the family eventually moved to Clay Ellum, Washington. And it is here that Douglas Monroe was raised. Uh, there's a picture of him as a child. 
His father was an active member of the American Legion post. Now, Doug was very gifted in music. Um, he was active in the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps, and he served as a march leader. Uh, <clears throat> now, friends and neighbors recall him playing taps on Memorial Day and on Veterans Day and during funerals. Um, he played trumpet in the pep band, um, the senior orchestra, and the dance orchestra. And he became quite an accomplished dancer himself. Uh, he was a natural athlete. He was a wrestler, a swimmer, a basketball player, hiker, skier, and quite an accomplished uh, tumbler. And I love this picture of him. He's quite fetching in that photo. Um, following his graduation from high school in 1937, he enrolls in Central Washington College of Education, which is now Central Washington University. And by all accounts, Monroe is an excellent student. But in his sophomore year, he begins to lose interest in his studies. He grows restless. Um, he commented to his parents how socially and politically isolated was Cleallum. Uh, at dinner one evening, he became involved in a very passionate discussion of the economics of the Great Depression. You know, he, he made a point of saying, in the Pacific Northwest, unemployment far exceeded the national average. Entire industries had been destroyed. Tent cities popped up and families were forced to scavenge for food. And so here we begin to see a young man who understands the plight of his neighbors and, and who is sympathetic and empathetic and, and who now seems to be on a path towards helping others. He had a childhood friend named Mike Cooley and together they earned money by delivering coal to those who could afford it. They would gather and split firewood and deliver it to those who could not afford it. Uh, his mother later said that she knew her son had, was going to have a life dedicated to helping others. Now, she also recalled listening to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's fireside chats. Tensions were rising in Europe, and in September 1938, Adolf Hitler's Germany invaded Poland. Uh, one evening at dinner, recalled Edith Monroe, he talked about compulsory enrollment in the military service, uh, a draft. Um, he stated that he would either enlist or he could wait to be drafted. He seemed to prefer the former. Um, his mother quickly changed the subject. I think like many mothers of sons, uh, she feared the war clouds that loomed. Now Douglas believed it was only a matter of time before the US entered the war. Um, he spent time researching the branches of the service. Now growing up in the Pacific Northwest, he's an outdoorsy kid. Um, he loves to swim, he's an accomplished swimmer, he taught swimming, um, and he used to go you know, out paddling in the Pacific surf. So he decides on one of the sea services. He takes a look at the Marine Corps and decides the Marine Corps is not for him. So he visits uh, a naval recruiting station, at least once that we know of, makes several trips to a Coast Guard uh, station. And ultimately, he decides that the Coast Guard, with its myriad of missions, offered him the greatest opportunity to help others in need as well as to travel. So he enlists in the Coast Guard, that's his photo. And he told his sister Patricia of his decision and said the, Marine, uh, the Coast Guard is focused on saving lives, not on taking them. Don't worry. Now, on the day that he left Cleallum, uh, his mother entered his room, looked around, and wondered when Douglas would return. Uh, on her way to the car, she stopped in the dining room, ran her hand on the back of his chair. Um, I would imagine that there were mothers all over America who did something like that. Um, his parents drove him the 90 miles to the recruiting station, and I think wanting to spare his parents and probably himself this very emotional goodbye, he jumped out of the car at an intersection and grabbed his small suitcase and said, so long, folks. And then he looked at his mother and said, don't worry, Mom. So he began walking. And as he approached the front door, he encountered another young man also carrying a suitcase. And this is one of my incredibly disappearing slides. Um, the gentleman he encounters is Ray Evans. Um, they would become best friends. Now, after completing the oath of enlistment, Monroe and Evans boarded a bus, 
bound for Air Station Port Angeles. And when they arrived, the staff was really pretty much at a loss what to do with them. Uh, the Coast Guard hadn't taken in any new recruits for a number of years. Training programs had been disbanded. New training programs hadn't been spun up. Said Ray Evans, they didn't know what to do with us, so they had us peeling potatoes, performing simple maintenance on boats, and mowing grass, the kind of things you usually see in cartoons. So on day three of training, day three, Monroe and Evans learned that the Treasury class cutter Spencer, we got the Spencer here, is being reassigned from Alaska to New York. They needed seven recruits to fill out the crew. So Evans and Monroe wasted no time. And that evening, Monroe telephoned his parents to let them know of his impending departure. Now, Monroe and Evans are soon, they're, they're together constantly, best friends. They come to be known as the Gold Dust Twins. So they were assigned as quartermasters, assigned to deck force. So they were responsible for maintaining rescue and survival equipment and maintaining deck equipment. Uh, at this point, the training was rigorous and it was thorough and it was completely on the job. Um, long days, short nights were the norm. Uh, Spencer, interestingly enough, was ordered to join a naval task force in search of the German ship Admiral Graf Spee. Now, Officials believed that the spay had entered U.S. waters illegally. Um, probably the best quote about this came from Evans, who said, that German cruiser was heavily armed. We had only two five-inch guns. I don't know what we would have done if we had actually found her. Now, in mid-November, Spencer drops anchors in the New York Navy Yard. Um, here again, days are long and hard, and the work is intense. Evans said everybody was given more than one job to do. That's the way it was, but there was no complaining. Everybody thought that war was imminent. And it was during this time that Monroe fell ill, and he was admitted incoherent to Staten Island Naval Hospital. He was suffering from pneumonia and, and really almost died. Um, it would be three to four weeks before he returned to what was his, described as his usual self. So... <clears throat> come on in, come on in. We're going to step aside a minute, and we're going to talk about neutrality patrols. Now, this was technically a Pan-American initiative, and the state of, stated objective of these patrols was to track and report on any movement by the Axis that approached the U.S. or the West Indies. Um, its real purpose was essentially a demonstration of power. Um, great idea. Two major problems. Uh, the first is that the Navy simply did not have enough vessels to support the initiative. Uh, the second is that Navy destroyers were not well suited to the waters of the North Atlantic. So in the spring of 1941, presidential authorization transferred six Coast Guard cutters, these are the Treasury class cutters, to the Navy. And one of those was the Spencer. And her first neutrality patrol began on 15 November 1939. Now, work aboard Spencer is never ending. And we've got a picture of Monroe taken aboard Spencer. Um, the patrols took a tremendous toll on the equipment and crew. Uh, sailors like to say that the winter conditions in the North Atlantic have to be experienced to be believed. Uh, you have water temperatures of 43 degrees, below freezing air temperatures. You've got swells of 10 to 30 feet, and you've got ice covering the entire ship. And it was during this time that Monroe and Evans were promoted to seamen second class. So they're doing well. Now, despite the weather and the ever-present threat of German U-boats, both were aware of what was at stake at this point. Now, as Europe became engulfed in the flames of war, Britain basically stood alone against the threat. The safety of Allied shipping in the North Atlantic was imperative. And that's what the cutter duty was, was all about. Um, Spencer's final uh, patrol concluded on 26 January 1940. Monroe and Evans were again promoted, seamen first class. So at this point, another task emerged. The flow of weather data coming from the merchant vessels transiting the Atlantic had significantly slowed, and that data was essential. So President Roosevelt ordered the Coast Guard in cooperation with the Weather Bureau with the creation of two ocean stations between Bermuda and the Azores. 
Now, Spencer sailed for Ocean Station 2 on 18 March 1940. Now, duty basically consisted of a cutter steaming continuously in a hundred miles square on a three-week three rotation. Um, this is incredibly monotonous duty for the crew. There are no outside comms. There's no mail. Um, so what are the Gold Dust Twins to do? They're bored out, bored out of their minds. Well, they found a welcome diversion. Um, at the end of World War I, the Coast Guard had all but abolished the signalman rating. Uh, these were the men who transmitted, received, encoded, decoded, and distributed messages via the use of signal flags and visual Morse code. I think we've got a, yeah, there's a little chart there. Now, as war loomed, um, the signalman's rating again became critical. Monroe and Evans saw this as an opportunity and volunteered to train. Spencer's executive officer agreed, but he reminded both that whatever training they took on was in addition to their regular duties. So they would train in the early morning hours after their assigned shifts. And, and the workload began to take a toll on both of them. Uh, more than once, Monroe was confined to sickbay. He suffered from debilitating migraine headaches. Uh, he'd be released and pick up right where he left off again. Um, so we see a young man who's not afraid to take on more responsibility. He's not afraid to work hard, even when it's to his own detriment. Now, in mid-April, Spencer returned to port, and Evans and Monroe were granted leave. They board a Greyhound bus. They're headed home and uh, spent a couple of weeks there. But Monroe grew increasingly restless. Um, conversation centered on the events overtaking the world and of the looming war, and Monroe wanted to get back to duty. So when they returned to Spencer, they found several changes to the cutter. Uh, she was now fitted out with the newest sonar and depth charge technology. They did three more deployments to Ocean Station 2. They owned, earned their signalman ratings, and then Spencer was subsequently ordered to Bethlehem Shipbuilding Corporation for further upgrades. Now, on 27 May 1941, the crew of Spencer listened as Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared an unlimited national emergency. He said, the war is approaching the Western Hemisphere itself. It is coming close to home. The battle for the Atlantic now extends from the icy waters of the North Pole to the frozen continent of Antarctica. War clouds loomed larger, and as the spring turned to summer, America continued to prepare for war. Congress passed the Two Ocean Navy Act, which increased naval procurement by 70%. Now, they're, both Monroe and Evans are promoted to signalman second class in May, and they were growing tired of duty in the Atlantic. They wanted something more exciting, something new. So an opportunity soon presents itself. FDR had ordered the Coast Guard to man four large transport ships and serve in crews on 22 naval vessels, all of which needed signalmen. So together, the Gold Dust Twins approached Spencer's executive officer and requested transfer to Hunter Liggett. He was, they were initially told, one of you can go, but not both of you. I can't, I, I need one of you. And they kept trying until finally the executive officer of the Spencer agreed and let them both transfer. And they transferred to Hunter Liggett. Now, she was a 535-foot Harris-class attack transport. She was originally built as a transatlantic passenger ship. She was converted uh, for naval use at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and subsequently commissioned AP-27 in June of 41. So Evans and Monroe joined a crew of 52 officers and about 650 enlisted men. At the time of their transfer, they thought they were assigned to the ship's company, but they soon discovered they were actually assigned to Transport Division 17. All of the officers of Transport Division 17 were Navy except for Lieutenant Commander Dwight Dexter. Now, Hunter Liggett sailed for Onslow Bay along the Carolina coast with other ships of the transport division. Each of them carried Higgins boats, the flat bottom craft designed for use in amphibious operations. Now, during joint exercises, 
it became clear that specialized crews were needed. Uh, reports actually stated, quote, the Navy crews proved frustratingly inept in maneuvering the newly designed landing craft in the surf. Coast Guardsmen had been expertly manning small craft in the surf zone since before the establishment of the U.S. Life Saving Service in 1871 and were the most seasoned small boat handlers in government service. And with that, the Coast Guard was tasked with one of the most important roles in World War II. So for seasoned Coast Guardsmen, you know, exercises conducted at Onslow Bay proved to be of little challenge. They were more skillful, they were more resourceful, more adept than their Navy counterparts. And it was here that both Evans and Monroe found another opportunity. They requested and received permission to train to handle small boats. Now, Evans later said that although he had become a good coxswain, that Doug was much better. He just had that instinct and that touch. And I'm not sure what that was, but whatever it was, Doug had it. He was a natural. Now, on 15 August, the command of Transport Division 17 is transferred to the USS Dickman. Oh, we got some Higgins boats there. That's the Dickman. Um, she proceeds to the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for upgrade and refit. Then she sails to Hampton Roads for practice drills in the Chesapeake Bay. And it was during this time that Monroe really mastered the art of maneuvering small boats. Uh, his, his innate abilities garnered him attention and notice um, from both Navy and Coast Guard personnel. Now, events in October brought the U.S. closer to war with Germany. Uh, the USS Kearney was on convoy duty when she was torpedoed. Eleven men were killed and another 22 were wounded. And two weeks later, the Reuben James, uh, seen on that side, um, was also to torpedoed. Her bow was blown off when a magazine exploded. Of the 160 crew, only 44 survived. Uh, she was the first Navy ship to be lost in the war. Now, two days later, Monroe and Evans are promoted to signalman first class. Transport Division 17 is transferred to the Leonard Wood. There we go. Um, Leonard Wood departs Halifax, Nova Scotia on 10 November. They're bound for Bombay, India. On December 7th, 1941, uh, as the transport rounded the Cape of Good Hope, an announcement came over the ship's PA system. The Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, said Evans, as casualty reports began being released, the mood changed from shock to anger. A quiet resolve seemed to come over us. No one had to tell us that we were at war. So the question is, what role would the Coast Guard play? Now, I can tell you that the role of the Coast Guard in World War II is all too often virtually unknown, overlooked, underestimated, and simply forgotten. Uh, I remember when we opened this building, we used to have to stand station out here in the Central Gallery, and I had a couple come up to me and asked, why is there a Coastie on the Medal of Honor wall, and, and what could he have done to deserve a Medal of Honor because the Coast Guard never left the States. Um, I actually heard that from someone yesterday as well. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, in the Atlantic, after the cutter Alexander Hamilton fell victim to a torpedo attack in January of 42, the other five cutters of the Treasury class, along with Navy destroyers, continued to be the mainstay of American convoy escort duty protecting both men and material bound for Europe. Uh, some pictures of, Coast Guard, of uh, Coast Guard convoy duty here. Now, additionally, the Coast Guard participated in every major landing in the European theater, from the Operation Torch landings in Vichy held North Africa in November 42 to Operation Overlord, D-Day, 6 June 1944, through Operation Anvil landings in southern France in August 44. The Coast Guard manned the assault transports, conducted rescue operations, and uh, landed troops on the invasion beaches. In the Pacific, the Coast Guard took Marines to the enemy on the beaches of Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Guam, Iwo Jima, Peleliu, and Okinawa. So, begs the question, what was the role of Douglas Albert Monroe? 
He was a single Coast Guardsman among 16 million Americans who served in World War II. Now, according to Evans, after the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the atmosphere aboard Leonard Wood changed. Tasks and duties that had become routine were no longer routine. Uh, laughing and joking on board subsided. We knew we were at war. Monroe and Evans, along with their shipmates, stood quietly and listened to the president's address on 8 December. I ask that Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, 7 December 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Now, Leonard Wood arrived in India under very tight security, and I actually found a photo of Leonard Wood taken in India, which was really cool. Um, when she offloaded the men and materiel she carried, she returned to Philadelphia for conversion into an amphibious attack transport. On 2 April, transport division's flag is again transferred, and Evans and Monroe find themselves back on Hunter Liggett. Now, this is where it starts to get really interesting. Hunter Liggett departs New York on April 9. She's carrying 1,500 troops bound for Wellington, New Zealand. This was the staging area for the Marine Corps operations in the Pacific. Now, upon her arrival, she was greeted by cheering crowds. They were waving American flags. There was a band playing Stars and Stripes forever. Uh, I actually could not find a picture of the Coast Guard being welcomed, but those are some Army troops. Uh, transport division flag again transferred, this time to the USS Neville. Now, they're, in well they're young men in Wellington, New Zealand. And yeah, they have duty, but they also decided to take time to enjoy all that Wellington had to offer. They wanted to meet the locals and see the sights, and they also went dancing to the Laurie Patty Orchestra at the Majestic Cabaret, which only closed a few years ago, by the way. And digging through an Australian uh, online history site, I actually found photos of the Laurie Patty Orchestra, an American serviceman in the Majestic Cabaret. Um, it was also here that Monroe met a young lady of whom he became very fond. Uh, she would correspond with his mother through the end, uh, to the end of her life. Now, in mid-July, Monroe is transferred to Macaulay. Uh, nope. He's transferred to Macaulay. Evan stays aboard Liggett. But the two get together often to swap stories and exchange scuttlebutt. Um, they watched thousands of men and equipment pour into the port city. Um, they knew something big was going to happen. Monroe believed they were be, to be a part of a major offensive. And Monroe thought that based upon the cargo being handled, that they were to establish a forward operating base. Um, it's a pretty wise observation. Uh, what they were witnessing was, in fact, the preparations for Operation Watchtower, the invasion of Guadalcanal. Now, some of the docents who are here who know me know that I could gladly stand here all day and talk about Guadalcanal, but, but we have limited time. Um, we don't have time to discuss the broad strategies for defeating the Japanese in the Pacific, but I do think it's important to understand how Guadalcanal became the first major offensive. Uh, there was a coast watcher by the name of Martin Clemens, and he reported Japanese expansion into the Western Pacific. Uh, on 3 May, the Imperial Japanese Naval Force uh, landed on the small island of Tulagi. And on, 28, uh, on the 28th, Clemens reported that a Japanese scouting party had landed at Lunga Point on the northern coast of Guadalcanal. Now, in early July, he reports the Japanese had begun constructing an airfield. And there it is right there. Um, this triggered a demand for offensive action in the Pacific. Why? Um, completion of this airfield on Guadalcanal might signal uh, the beginning of a renewed enemy advance to the south and an increased threat to that American lifeline of supplies to New Zealand and Australia. Uh, by 21 August, Japanese forces had landed at Buna on the east coast of New Guinea, uh, matching their advance in the Solomons. So if you look here, you got the Solomons here. So they've, they've built up here, and they're building up here as well, definitely pushing south. Um, 
Airstrips for land-based planes were con uh, constructed at Rabaul, on Bougainville, and on Guadalcanal. Seaplane bases were established at Gavutu, at Gizo, on Santa Isabel Island, and along the Buca Passage. So Allied convoys were now susceptible to attack, thus threatening those supply lines. Uh, Clemens at this point reported that there were 1,850 Japanese on Tulagi and almost 5,300 on Guadalcanal. So on 23 July 42, the Joint Chiefs of Staff agreed that the Japanese advance had to be stopped, Guadalcanal and Tulagi had to be taken. Now on the morning of 22 July, the flagship Macaulay with Rear Admiral uh, Kelly Terrible Turner aboard pulled away from uh, Wellington. They were bound for Fiji. Uh, Macaulay down here. Um, soon joined by the carrier task forces of Saratoga and Wasp. Oh, got Saratoga, Wasp. Next day they're joined by the carrier group of the Enterprise um, in the Coral Sea. Uh, because the invasion fleet maintained radio silence, all communication was conducted by signalmen, so Monroe and Evans were kept very busy. Now, during this transit, according to Evans, Monroe spent a lot of time below decks with Marines. Uh, Evans later said that Monroe felt comfortable there, and although he had not been interested in joining the Corps, he came to admire that devotion to duty he saw in those young men. These were young men he thought would rather die than quit, and who had a history of being the first in the fight. So 12 days before their scheduled landing, the Expeditionary Combined Task Force arrived in Fiji for a rehearsal, and it was an absolute failure. Uh, the coastline did not at all resemble what was described in operational briefs. The tide was much lower than expected, uh, with coral reefs looming ominously, the practice landing was canceled. Um, Senior commanders met aboard Saratoga. It was not a pleasant meeting at all. Vice Admiral Fletcher, who commanded Task Force 61 and therefore had command of the carrier groups, um, was not particularly interested in the Guadalcanal operation. He thought it was something of a waste of time. And he declared that he would pull the carriers out after 72 hours since, uh, from the point the invasion began. This was something that Marine General Alexander Vandegrift, commanding the 1st Marine Division, considered nothing short of suicidal. Now, on 6 August, the men of the Combined Task Force prepared for the battle to come. On Hunter Liggett, Evans and the other coxswains tested their boats. Aboard Macaulay, Monroe was doing the same. Evans later said, as Doug stood at the throttle of his boat while it was being unlashed and swung out on a davit, looking something like this. He saw Marines quietly sharpening knives and bayonets, inspecting canteens and grenades, blackening rifle sights and applying oil to rifle bores. Machine gunners skillfully loaded 250 round ammunition belts in rectangular green cases. Navy corpsmen assigned to the Marines checked medical supplies and supply kits, loading extra medication and bandages in anticipation of the battle to come. He said as Doug watched that, he later said he released, realized his personal safety and that of the boat was secondary to the mission of getting the Marines to the beaches and of taking the fight to the enemy. So, what was the plan? Well, Combat Group A was ordered to land on Red Beach, right there, um, halfway between Longa and Coley Point on the north coast of the island. Combat Group B would land on Red Beach about 50 minutes later, pivot to the right, and seize a grassy knoll some four miles south of Longa. Um, keep that grassy knoll in mind. It's going to be important later. Uh, other combat groups were assigned the task of seizing Gavutu, Tulagi, and Florida Island. Now, on the morning of 7 August, Lieutenant Colonel Merritt Edson and the first readers came ashore hitting Tulagi south coast and moving inland. Uh, Tulagi. Um, so they hit the south coast, they move inland. The first two waves encountered strong resistance, largely unexpected. Um, as the third wave is about to launch, Monroe is standing at the throttle of his boat. 
There's an American flag flying. He's listening to the sounds of battle. He hears mortar fire, automatic weapons fire, artillery fire. He hears the deck guns blasting. And after two runs, uh, the third wave is delivered. Um, Monroe beaches his boat. He grabs semaphore flags and a blinker light and uh, assumes the role of a signalman ashore. And at one point during the night, he climbed aboard a large uh, exposed route cropping and he continued to send messages in, uh, via blinker light. And one Marine at this, report, at this point reportedly asked, are you sure you aren't one of us? Um, the main, main invasion force came ashore, hit the beaches of Guadalcanal just after nine. And uh, unfortunately, they had very little information on the terrain and conditions they faced. Uh, Coast watcher Clemens uh, later described Guadalcanal as a poisonous morass, crocodiles in her creeks and her turgid backwaters. Her jungles were alive with slithering, crawling, scuttling things, with giant lizards that bark like dogs, with centipedes and leeches and scorpions, with rats and bats and fiddler crabs. There were devouring myriads of sucking, biting, burrowing insects that found sustenance in human blood, armies of fiery white ants, swarms upon swarms of filthy black flies that fed upon open cuts and made festering ulcers of them, and clouds of malaria-bearing mosquitoes. Uh, these conditions would actually prove almost as deadly as the Japanese, um, the American forces were fighting. Now, at this point, it's important to keep in mind that Guadalcanal had no cargo facilities. They had no docks, no wharves, no piers. Now, when the Marines came ashore, boat crews bought in supplies, equipment, and ration. Uh, the scene very soon, oh, sorry about that. I may have had another disappearing slide. Ah, here we go. Um, scene becomes very chaotic. Uh, supplies on the beaches were simply unloaded and left there. Um, so at 0230 on 9 August, Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander Dwight Dexter came ashore to establish Naval Operating Base Cactus. Um, it would be established on Lunga Point, right there. Um, the interesting thing about Cactus, and the name Cactus comes from the code name for Guadalcanal, <clears throat> its purpose was to reduce the bottleneck of supplies and equipment on the beach. Um, it would also provide logistical support and waterborne transportation for the Marines throughout the campaign. Marines came to know them as taxis to hell. Um, it was also the first and only time a naval operating base was uh, commanded and manned by Coast Guard. Now, upon his arrival, uh, Dexter climbs aboard a stack of cartons and he begins directing the unloading of supplies and their transfer from the beach to areas within the marine perimeter. Now they're faced, remember, with Admiral Fletcher's deadline for pulling out the ships assigned to uh, the carrier group. So crews are working at a frenzied pace. And at this point, Vandegrift, uh, Vandegrift, this is Admiral Turner, uh, were informed that Fletcher was pulling out early. Uh, Admiral Turner's comment was, he's left us bare-assed. Um, Turner had no choice but to withdraw the now largely unescorted transports and cargo ships. Um, Guadalcanal receives less than 60, to day, 60 days supply of rations, to Tulagi even less. So the Navy was leaving, the Coast Guard and the Marines were on their own, and basically at this point, Operation Watchtower becomes Operation Shoestring. So here's Dexter, a few days later, he's still trying to make sense of the mess on the beach. He inquires as to the whereabouts of Monroe. He was told Monroe had been to, assigned to Tulagi, and Dexter replied, I need him here. They're mopping up over there, get him over here now. So aboard Macaulay, Monroe is subsequently stole, told you've been transferred. Get yourself and your boat over to Cactus and report to Dexter. So Monroe's approaching the beach. Uh, he sees Evans and Dexter awaiting his arrival. He's wearing a hat, khaki shorts, and boots. And he's got his rifle slung over his shoulder. And Dexter asks, is that how you report for duty, son? 
And Monroe said, it is today, sir. <laughs> so, uh, so Dexter kind of shook his head and looked at him and said, well, come on, we've got work to do. So by 12 August, the Marines on Guadalcanal had established a beachhead with a perimeter approximately seven miles long and two miles deep. Um, the runway at Henderson Field was extended to almost 2,600 feet, and a thin line of defense of, uh, extended from the Ailu River to the west around Lunga to about 1,000 yards west and south of the village of Kukum. Now, three days later, three de destroyer transports arrive with a Marine Air Operations Detachment They've also got some avgas, some bombs, some ammunition, some spare parts. But that same evening, the Japanese landed supplies and reinforcements on the western side of Guadalcanal. Vandegrift is worried that the Japanese can put more supplies and more importantly, fresh troops on the island. Uh, he feared the Marines were going to become outnumbered and outgunned. Now at Cactus, Monroe and Evans continued their missions. They were conducting anti-submarine patrols along Iron Bottom Sound. Evans later said, you could see that Doug was pretty much in charge of our contingent of small boats and tank lighters. Officers, including Dexter himself, would consult with him on questions regarding small boat mission, maintenance, things like that. In addition to his ability to handle boats, he had emerged as a leader. Everyone could see that. Plus what he had done on Tulagi followed him to Guadalcanal. The Marines thought he was great. Now, as August turns to September, the lack of supplies begin to take a heavy toll. Uh, Marines had become emaciated from their twice daily rations of rice. They had an ever increasing workload by day. They were patrolling at night. Many were ravaged by dysentery and by jungle rot. Uh, rates of malaria were rising dramatically. For every man lost in combat at this point, five fell to disease. And that same environment took a toll to the Coast Guardsmen assigned to Cactus. Both Evans and Monroe were suffering from malaria. Interestingly enough, both chalked it up to working long hours in a miserable climate. Um, now, elements of the 6th Naval Construction Battalion, the Seabees, uh, arrived on 1 September. Uh, they took over uh, the mission of keeping this muddy airfield in usable condition and extending it to allow use by B-17s and B uh, B-24s. Now, the Marines responsible for the defense of the airfield dug trenches and foxholes along a thousand foot line in preparation for a fight they knew was coming. Uh, that fight was known as the Battle for Edson's Ridge. Uh, it was 12 to 14 September. It secured the airfield and remains to this day one of the most storied battles in Marine Corps history. Then on 18 September, the tide turns. Early in the morning, Task Force 65 anchored off Kukum. Uh, destroyers shelled Japanese positions. More than 4,000 Marines came ashore, among them the 7th Marines. In command of 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, was Lieutenant Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller, who was already something of a legend in the Corps. Now, the importance of the arrival of these fresh Marines can't be overstated. 1-7 was a full-strength fresh battalion, 34 officers, 857 enlisted Marines. This is a far cry from the combat and disease-ridden units ashore. So for the first time, Vandegrift has sufficient strength to establish an unbroken defensive line around Longa Point. Um, at this point, a news correspondent did ask Vandegrift if he thought he could hold the beachhead, and his response was, well, hell yes, why not? Um, cactus crews worked tirelessly to ensure the rapid unloading of much-needed supplies, uh, avgas, vehicles, ration, and ammo. Keep in uh, mind that this was the first full uh, resupply of ammo they had had since the invasion began and the Navy departed. Now, despite good news, Vandegrift continued to worry about the ease in which the Japanese could resupply. He feared Japanese movement into the areas around Henderson Field. Uh, the shallowness of the marine perimeter made it theoretically possible for the Japanese to place the airfield under bombardment, and they would then therefore um, uh, deprive the Marines of aerial firepower. 
So that brings us to the subject of most interest today, uh, the second battle of the Matanikau. Um, the Matanikau River, and I pinched this off Getty, as you can see, um, muddy river, uh, five miles west of the Lunga. It's swift, it's deep, and at its mouth, it is almost unfordable. And as September waned, its importance grew to both Japanese and American forces. On 19 September, Vandegrift unveiled a new operational plan, uh, which divided the marine defense into new sectors with increased all-around strength. Uh, plans called for the expansion of the perimeter to the mouth of the Matanikau on the west and the Tenaru on the east. Now, Vandegrift is aware that the giant Japanese 124th Infantry, as well as the 4th Infantry Regiment, were somewhere in the jungles of Guadalcanal. Um, his plans for actions to the west uh, were a series of modest operations that would keep the large Japanese forces from establishing themselves within striking distance of the marine perimeter. Now, the obvious choice for this operation is 1-7, fresh unit. The plan called for the battalion to find and reconnoiter a trail that led from the south of Edson's Ridge to the headwaters of the Matanikau. So, up this way. Nope, sorry, this way. Oh, okay. Um, they would search for a suspected enemy uh, observation post on the slopes of Mount Austin. Remember that grassy knoll? I mentioned earlier that grassy knoll was in effect uh, was in fact Mount Austin. It's the highest point on Guadalcanal. It overlooked the entire marine perimeter. Um, so they needed to to reconnoiter that. And then the Japanese, um, uh, pardon me, um, the battalion would then cross the river, move down the bank to clear it of any Japanese forces. Uh, the first Raider battalion would establish a patrol base to the west. And uh, Vandegrift later said, we thought that if anybody could get a battalion up the river and get it across and to the Japanese, it would be Louis Puller. Now, unbeknownst to the Marines, they knew the Japanese were there. They didn't realize there were 4,000 Japanese in the vicinity of the Matanikau. Um, most were west of the river. One company sat in the foothills of Mount Austin. Now, Puller only takes three companies on this operation. He has a force of just under 600 men. They move through the perimeter on the morning of 24 September. They're accompanied by a native scout, a Marine gunner named Edward Rust from the 5th Marines, and a liaison team from the 11th Marines to direct supporting artillery fire. So, under a cloudless sky, the Marines slowly made their way through this thick, thick, stifling jungle, up and over precipitous grass-covered ridges. Um, terrain plays havoc with the formation. It's very steep. So they're bunching up and stretching out. Um, afternoon rain comes, makes the conditions even worse. Everything gets slippery, and then it turns into this thick, sucking mud. Um, so the advance is further slowed. In the late afternoon, the point squad began looking for a place to bivouac. Uh, Corporal Harold Turner uh, investigated a grassy rise. Captain Reagan Fuller stumbles upon two Japanese soldiers who are squatting over a pair of cooking pots full of rice. He kills one, Turner's squad kills the other. Puller, who is in his habitual place near the front of the column, uh, comes forward to see what's going on. Here's Chesty reaching down to sample the captured Japanese chow and machine gun fire rakes the area. Uh, company A is now pinned down. Puller calls for Company B. Enemy, enemy fire is so heavy at this point that one lieutenant described it as the bushes and uh, leaves waved and bent over as if it were a gale. Uh, leaders of both 1st and 2nd platoons were killed. The enemy is dug in and has fire superiority. Forward artillery observer uh, called in an artillery mission, but the first adjusting round landed on marine lines. Uh, Puller orders a withdrawal of about 300 yards to another ridge, set up a perimeter for the night. Uh, the battalion sustained a number of casualties. They had seven killed and 25 wounded. 
at 2300 hours he made his first report to division and Puller requested air support for a continuation of the attack the following day he also said he needed stretchers for 18 of his wounded now he made no estimate of enemy casualties but among the marines who were there they thought they had gotten the worst of the fight uh, Vandegrift realizes that the evacuation of 18 stretcher cases over this rugged terrain would take at least 100 able-bodied men. So he orders 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines to reinforce Puller. Uh, this additional uh, battalion was put under Puller's command. Vandegrift tells Puller the next step was his. You can continue the attack or return as you decide in accordance with your situation in the morning. Well done and good luck. Interestingly enough, Vandegrift's orders to the acting CO of 25, who is a captain at this point, is slightly different. Um, he emphasized his desire that the combined units push ahead if the terrain and conditions are suitable. So 25 arrives at Puller's position at 0825. He tasked uh, A and B companies 17 with taking the wounded back to the Marine perimeter. Company C and 2-5 would push ahead toward the Montanacau. Now, this is a pretty strange decision. Um, it puts Puller in charge of a force he did not know. Um, don't know why. Maybe he thought um, the veteran unit was in better shape than his bloodied unit, or maybe he thought it was better that his own men take care of the wounded. We don't know. Uh, 25 September. Puller's combined unit advanced along the trail. They encountered no enemy soldiers. Uh, that evening, he informed division he would return to the perimeter. The next day, following the coast along the, a route the Japanese called the Maizuru Road. Now, unbeknownst to Puller, there were elements of the 124th Infantry that simply managed to evade his force. So the Marines move out early on the morning of the 26th. At 11.25, the leading elements of the Japanese 12th Company brush Puller's column, but little came of that encounter. He continues his push toward the Montanacau, and as he did so, the 12th Company simply moved into his wake to take up positions on the east side of the river. Now, at 1400, Company E attempted to cross the river. Puller's Marines were barely in the water when the Japanese 9th Company opened up with mortars and machine guns. He immediately gets on the radio to report the opposition. Uh, the situation is further confused when Division Operations Section thought he was already on the other side of the river, and he was advised that the 1st Raider Battalion was moving up the coast road in accordance with the original battle plan. Now, until they arrived, Company E provided a base of fire for two assaults by Company G. Both of them failed. And here we have the issue of having a combined uh, battalion arise. Um, plainly stated, Puller was reluctant to listen to the officers from 2-5 when a lieutenant who commanded one of the failed attacks stated the strength of the opposition. Puller ignored him. Uh, he also refused a request to division for stretcher bearers and a resupply of medical supplies. Yet when the battalion surgeon from 1-7 made the same request, Puller acquiesced. Now, he did react to the failure of his tactics. He called off the infantry attacks and requested air. Um, PFC Johnny Smolka moved out under the beach under enemy fire and used semaphore flags to contact a destroyer of offshore. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. If you look at all the Marine Corps records, from the battalion up through the division, uh, they all say that ship was the Ballard. If you look at Coast Guard records, um, many of them say it was the Ballard. Um, official Marine Corps histories say it was the Ballard. It won the Ballard. Um, the Ballard was actually on her way towards Espiritu Santo. Her deck logs um, reveal nothing out of the ordinary. The ship was the destroyer Monson. Um, her logs clearly show that at 1530 she proceeded to a position off the Matanacau to provide supporting fire for a Marine patrol. 35 minutes later, Marine gunner Edward Rust swam out to one of Monson's small boats. It was an act for which he would be awarded a silver star. 
So he can act as liaison officer for shore bombardments. Five minutes later, Monson commenced firing. Puller wondered what to do next. He had 25 more casualties. At 1630, the first raiders arrive on scene. Division radioed Puller that Colonel Merritt Edson uh, had been dispatched to command combined forces in continuation of the attack. Um, the original plan had not contemplated much enemy opposition, but Vandegrift was resolved to achieve the objective despite the change in circumstances. Now, Edson issues orders for the next day. In an, event, uh, in an effort to envelop the enemy, the Raiders and Charlie Company 1-7 were to move 2,000 yards south along the Matanikau, cross over, and then attack back towards the coast. Uh, to keep the enemy fixed in place, 2-5 was to conduct a frontal assault across the river. The third element of the plan called for the remaining companies of 1-7, now back in the marine perimeter, to make an amphibious landing near Point Cruz to feel, seal off the enemy's avenue of retreat. And this is where Doug Monroe comes back into the story. Um, Marine commanders approached Dexter on the morning of 27 September to coordinate that amphibious landing. The plan called for the Higgins boats and tank lighters to embark the uh, Marines at Kukum and transport them to the head of the small cove on the east side of Point Cruz. Uh, the Marines were then to drive straight inland. Division had range for covering fire from Monson. Um, Unfortunately, that plan did not unfold as anticipated. So after a night of heavy rain, the Raiders and Company C move out. As they approach a small one-long bridge, they came under fire from the Japanese 12th Company. They were in well-chosen positions on the east side. There was Japanese mortar positions on the west side. So if you think about a bottle with a very narrow, thin neck, the Raiders are pushing up that area. It's a steep ravine. You've got Japanese on both sides. Ken Bailey, who was a hero of the battle for Edson's Ridge and who would be awarded a Medal of Honor, um, was executive officer of the Raiders. He was killed by machine gun fire. Lieutenant Colonel Sam Griffiths, also seriously wounded, but refused evacuation. He tried to slip two companies to his left to outflank the Japanese, but they were pinned down. You have mounting casualties. Further complicate matters with both senior raiders down, there was more confusion, and that translated into a very ambiguous report of progress to division. Edson believed the raiders had succeeded in gaining the enemy's right flank beyond the river. So at 10.30, Gulf Company 2-5 launches an attack across the mouth of the Matanikau as planned, and they are turned back. Um, after the operational briefing, Dexter placed Monroe in charge of the boat operation. He and the other coxswains spent the morning ensuring all boats were operational and mission ready. Now, Major Otho Rogers is 1-7's executive officer. He didn't receive word of his part in the battle until 10 o'clock that morning. Still dressed in a stiff khaki uniform that he had worn to church, Rogers only told his men that they were going to land in two waves at 1300. That was the only information they had. So the Marines embark at 12.30. Monroe's boat is in the lead. He's followed closely by Evans. About a mile offshore from their intended landing sites, the boats rendezvoused with Monson, which begins covering fire. Now, according to the deck logs, uh, Marine Lou Walt actually came ashore. He's with 2-5 by now to coordinate that covering fire. Within a few minutes, the Japanese air raid came in from Rabaul. This is the 11th Air Fleet. They launched 18 Betty bombers, 38 Zeros. Monson takes ev evasive action. Now, with a warning from the Coast Watchers, uh, Marine and Navy Wildcats rise into the sky. Again, bad luck. One bomb manages to damage Division Headquarters communication. So it further exacerbates all of the communication issues. Uh, Edson and Division believed that the Raiders had already crossed the river and were battling on the west side. So this in turn generated orders for renewal of attack. And you had three companies of 1-7 proceeding to Point Cruz to attack from the rear. Now, about 1,000 yards offshore, Monroe saw what appeared to be a coral reef blocking their landing. He maneuvers, uh, Evans maneuvers his boat along 
uh, site of Monroe and they quickly scan the area for an alternative landing site. They agree their only option was about 100 yards up the coast on a very narrow beach. Major Otho Rogers is informed that once ashore, the Marines would have to make a flanking maneuver to the left to maintain their plan. Now, Rogers leads his force to a grassy ridge about 500 yards inland from the coast road. Now, remember, the Japanese had been anticipating this for three days, and they react very quickly. Mortar shells begin to fall on lead uh, elements of the battalion. Rogers is killed instantly. A company commander is wounded. Command falls to a Captain Charles Kelly. Um, you have the Japanese battalion approaching from the west. The 12th company from the Matanikau village in the east. Uh, two Marines hastily set up a machine gun position and they uh, inflicted numerous casualties now before being overrun. Now, due to the hasty preparations of the morning, 1-7 was not well equipped. They had only one mortar, 40 mortar rounds, uh, in order to bring that to bear on the advancing Japanese. A mortarman had to lie on his back with his feet supporting the nearly perpendicular tube while Master Sergeant called the range down to a mere 200 yards. This is danger close. Kelly also learns that they left with no radios. He's got no radios. He's got no means of of requesting support. He's got no means to let no division know what's happening. Uh, in the words of one historian, they are on the verge of recreating Custer's last stand. Um, they're desperate. Uh, they're surrounded. They're under attack. So what do they do? They strip off their white t-shirts and they use the t-shirts to spell out help. Luckily, there's an SBD pilot oh, uh, circling overhead. He sees that message, radios it to division, who in turn radios it to Edson's command post. So as Edson gains more knowledge of this deteriorating situation on the ground, he halts the attack. Uh, Puller argued for a renewed attack by the units on the east side of the river. Edson refused to order what he considered another hopeless charge across open water into these strong enemy positions. He also orders the raiders to withdraw. Puller at this point is livid. He said, most of my battalion is out there alone. They're cut off with support. You're not going to throw these men away. So Puller makes his way to the beach. He has a signalman contact Monson. Now at his request, a launch picks him up. Now it's part of Marine Corps legend that says Puller commandeered that destroyer. Puller didn't commandeer the destroyer. Um, if you look at the deck logs, it says, Lieutenant Colonel Puller comes ashore to you know, act as a liaison for shore bombardment. Um, Puller is familiar with naval gunfire. He had done two tours aboard ship. So he's huddled with the gunnery officer while the captain radios Cactus for landing craft. Now Monroe and Evans are just returning to Cactus operational building. Just before they reach the end of the pier, they see Dexter running towards them. He's yelling. They couldn't hear them because of the sound of the engines running. Um, whatever he's yelling about, it ain't good. Dexter reportedly said, are you ready to go back and get those jarheads off the beach? They're getting hit pretty hard. Monroe looked at Heaven, Evans and said, oh, hell yeah, we are. Um, so when Monson reached the point, Puller sent messages by blinker and semaphore flags to his men ashore. He directs the destroyer to lay down a barrage between the coast and the ridge, then shift it to the flanks as the Marines withdrew. So Monson's guns fire 38 five-inch rounds. Because of the confusion caused by so much incoming fire, you have the rounds coming in from Monson, Japanese mortar fire, the Marine Corps column splits in two. <clears throat> <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so all this time, you also have the Japanese pushing from the rear and now from the flanks. Japanese infantry rushed <coughs> forward to cut off Company A. You have platoon sergeant Anthony Malinkowski. He picks up a BAR from a, 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 a Marine who had been killed in action. And he covered the withdrawal until he was overrun and killed. Um, that was an action for which he would be posthumously awarded a Navy Cross. It gave his company a chance to reach the beach and set up a hasty defense to cover the others. Um, so you have Monroe and Evans in the lead. The 24 landing craft approach the beach. 
uh, we all know this picture. Um, enemy mortar fire caused violent eruptions of water that drenched the crews. It decreased maneuverability and visibility. Automatic weapon fire splintered boats. Um, they were taking fire from the high ground above the Marines on the beach and from the protecting, uh, projecting terrain of point crews to the east. Uh, the boats were forced to pull back. Monroe said, we're going in. Lieutenant Leslie, who's still flying around in that SBD, uh, strafed the Japanese. He flew low over the landing craft to sort of lead them to the coast. Um, Monroe, his uh, craft is parallel with the shore. Um, Evans, right near him, provide covering fire from one of his boats to machine guns. So you have waves of dirty, haggard, bloody Marines that are running from the beach into the water. They're dragging their wounded. The dead were left behind. If you look at the casualty cards for those who are left behind, they are still listed as killed in action, body not recovered. Um, one Marine reportedly looked at Evans and said, you came back, thank God you came back. So within minutes, almost 500 Marines are off the beach, they're in the water. Japanese troops armed with mortars and automatic weapons are now set up right on the beach. Uh, the Marines are almost defenseless. Monroe maneuvers his boat so that, that it's between the Marines and the beach. Um, he's giving the Marines cover. He and Evans continued to provide covering fire until the last of the Marines were loaded. Now with all the boats away, he turned the bow of his craft to begin the return trip to Cactus. And it was then that he sees one of the boats is caught on a reef. So he maneuvers his craft a long time and he calls uh, alongside, he calls for a tow rope. He makes several attempts to free the boat, finally does. Now as he pulled his boat in behind the one that had just been free, Evan said he saw water spout, small water spouts dance across the water. Um, Monroe was hit by machine gun fire. A single round got him in the back of the neck at the base of the skull. And two weeks shy of his 23rd birthday, Douglas Monroe took his last breath. Now, the second battle of the Matanikau cost the Marines 60 dead and 100 wounded. Uh, that engagement was a clear defeat for the Marines since they failed to achieve their objective and were forced to retire from the field. All concerned felt lucky to have escaped without greater bloodshed. Now, the official Marine Corps history did not call the battle a defeat, but did acknowledge that it came the closest of any ground action in World War II. Edson referred to it as the, set, uh, the abortive second Matanikau and, and rarely spoke of it afterwards. Um, the after action report for the 1st Marine Division stated, but for the good judgment of senior commander present, our losses might have been much more, more severe. Yet among the participants, there's a lot of this. Um, Puller blamed Edson. Twining, who was the assistant operations officer, blamed Puller. Um, Twining actually said that it was a good example of how not to run a battle. Um, in short, the second Matanikau was marred by lack of intelligence on both the enemy and the terrain. Uh, units were committed along unreconnoitered routes beyond mutual support range and without coordination of movement or of air or artillery support. It is a prime example of mission creep. There were no clear objectives, only reaction from units who had been cobbled together. Now, that after action report, however, also noted that individual heroism would what, was what had saved the day. Puller officially praised a number of his Marines, uh, the Coast Guard boat crews, and the crew of Monson. Uh, Commander Dwight Dexter later told Evans that he had received a radio message from Puller upon hearing of Monroe's death. All that said, we do not know for certain. Um, Monroe's Medal of Honor recommendation package uh, has not been found. We don't have it. Um, I talked to the Navy. The Navy said, call the National Archives. I talked to the National Archives. They said, talk to the Navy. The Navy said, talk to the Marine Corps. I talked to the Marine Corps, and they said, call the Coast Guard, to which I responded, we are the Coast Guard. Um, so it's, I have Monroe's service record book. 
it's not there. The only information we have on the recommendation package itself is what we have from Dwight Dexter. Now, the following day, Monroe is laid to rest in the 1st Marine Division Cemetery. He was buried in row 22, grave 3. That simple burial was attended by Evans, Dexter, and a number of Marines. Now, on 27 September, Edith Monroe is at home in Cleelum, and she's feeling very restless. That restlessness grows, grows to a sense of panic. She starts walking. She runs to Holy Nativity Episcopal Church in South Cleelum. She said she stayed there for several hours until she began to feel a sense of peace. Now, half a world away, Dexter sat down to write a letter, not an official letter, but a personal letter to the Monroe family. And upon completion of that letter, it was given to a yeoman to type. Apparently, that yeoman also forwarded a copy of Puller and the Marine Corps. Dexter later said that there was a copy of that in the recommendation package. Now, on 15 October, an article appeared in the Seattle Times. It was written by Marine Master Sergeant James Hurlburt. On 20 September, the Corps, uh, he was a combat correspondent. He accompanied four volunteers on a mission to rescue two downed flyers off Savo Island. Two of those volunteers were Evans and Monroe. And only four days later, after this article appears, the Monroe family is notified of Douglas's death on Guadalcanal. Dexter's letter arrives the same day. So on Guadalcanal, the battle continued to rage. By October, Evans and Dexter were both suffering from the incapacitating effects of malaria. Before they were medically evacuated, they visited the 1st Marine Division Cemetery to tell Doug's stories. Um, they both laughed, recalling his less than regulation appearance when he reported for duty at Cactus. Dexter said, he was a sight, I'll, I'll tell you that, but I was glad to have him. Now, at home in Cleelum, Edith Monroe tried to channel her energies into something constructive, something that had a connection to her son. She learned that President Roosevelt was set to sign Public Law 773, which would allow women to serve in the shore establishment of the Coast Guard, the SPARS. She intended to enlist. The Coast Guard offered Edith a direct reserve commission. She accepted that on the grounds that she be allowed to attend and complete uh, the six-week training course at the Coast Guard Academy. Now, in March 43, Marine correspondent Hurlbert prepared to leave Guadalcanal. Before he did so, he visited Monroe's gravesite and penned a letter to Monroe's father. He said, Doug was one of the finest men I have met in the service, kind, courteous, thoughtful, and above all, courageous. His death, even in a place where death was commonplace, shocked me. Doug gave his life in an effort to save the lives of others. Even though Doug was killed, the boats got in, and many men who would have otherwise been lost were saved. Believe me, Doug is one of the real heroes of this war. Now, in April 43, Edith wrote in Coast Guard magazine, At first, the news of his death was unbearable, but as time goes on, we begin to see that his life's mission was finished on this earth. I would like you to know that it was the very high traditions of the Coast Guard service, the saving and preserving of life, which definitely decided Douglas to enter the Coast Guard. And this has been and will continue to be a great comfort to his father and myself. Now in early May, the Coast Guard notified the Monroe family that the Medal of Honor recommendation had been approved by President Roosevelt on 27 May, so eight months to the day of his death. Monroe's posthumous Medal of Honor was presented to his parents Shortly afterwards at Coast Guard headquarters, Edith Monroe at the age of 48 and wearing her dress uniform repeated the same oath of office her son had taken. Should also be noted that Ray Evans received a Navy Cross for the same actions on 27 September. So here we are, 75 years after the battle for Guadalcanal, 75 years after the death of Douglas Monroe. Yet we're here to remember this extraordinary young man. Now, Marine Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Harvey Barnum stated Doug Monroe led by example and, epitome the, and epitomized the Coast Guard motto Semper Paratus, always ready when he came to our aid on Guadalcanal. Admiral Robert Papp Jr., former Commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, perhaps said it best. 
Our Coast Guard is fortunate to have many great heroes. We have a long history of men and women with the courage to navigate those uncertain and stormy seas that drive others to safe harbor. Douglas Monroe was one of those people. With his dying breath, he thought not of himself, but those he had gone to rescue. Douglas Monroe defines us. He captures perfectly who we are as Coast Guardsmen and provides a shining example of our service, eso, service ethos. I will protect them, I will defend them, I will save them. <laughs>